our lesson, uh, uh, the adult Sunday school lesson is restoring worship. Um, the, the thought is, I will make my life a house of worship. God's house should be filled with the sacrifice of worship. Our uh, reading from, for today is from Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, and then some readings from Psalm 118. Starting with Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for standing in the word of God. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and, and his brethren, the priests of Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, and his brethren, and builded an altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Uh, they set the altar upon his bases, for the fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feasts of tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both in the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zion and to them of Tyre, to uh, bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now the second year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shalatiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua. Uh, with his sons and his brethren, Kadmiel, uh, the sons of his, and his sons and the sons of Judah together, to set forward the workmen in the house of God, and the sons of Hanadad with their sons and their brethren with the Levites. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asva, with symbols to praise the Lord unto, after the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever uh, toward Israel. For all people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. Hallelujah. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy and the noise of the weeping of the people for the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. Amen. Amen. Um, I guess those things about shouting often catch my mind because it seems like I do a lot of shouting. People might think I'm a little bit too loud sometimes, but I just said, it's in the Bible. It's okay. It's in the Bible. It's right. It's, a, it's not a wrong thing to do. God has done great things. God has done great things for me. He has given me a reason to shout. I haven't always been one to shout. Oh, but God, hallelujah, who is rich in mercy. All right, let's go to Psalms 118, 1 through 4. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. We'll go to uh, 26 through 29. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good together for his mercy endureth forever. Amen. Hallelujah. I hope that you enjoy the word of God today. I'll look forward to listening to it. <laughs> I'm going to take the children uh, to class. <laughs> Nathan, he's smiling at Grammy. Um, enjoy God's word. Soak it in. It's good. The Lord's mercy endureth forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Sunday school session today. Amen. And certainly, the, uh, as our subject matter today, uh, restoring worship. We'll get into that a little more, but I just wanted to first speak about the subject of worship. And I thought uh, worship was uh, not created by man. And, and he, man had nothing to do with the original uh, act of worship. Uh, even before man was created, when we look into the scriptures concerning the days of creation, uh, man wasn't created until the sixth day of creation. And, and so, but the, other, the first five uh, that were created, we can even see uh, worship has always been ingrained in uh, the hand in God's uh, creation that He created. And now they didn't have the intelligence, the things of the world up until man. They didn't have the intelligence that God created in man. But nevertheless, uh, when God created each day, and at the end of each day, we see. That where God looked at the day that he created and he said, it is good. Amen. Amen. So, uh, and I got to believe that uh, uh, what has always been in God's creation is uh, what we're looking at today is certainly a form of worship. For even the inanimated things that God created give uh, glory to God. Amen. Even in the way they were created, as uh, I believe it was David also said, when he considered the sun, the moon, the stars, and, and all of their glory, and all of that, uh, the way God created things, he's, what is man, you see? Well, man is uh, the creature that God created uh, that he favored above all else. And then that we were created in the image and the likeness of God, and God gave us an intelligence above everything else. Amen. And so should it be any wonder that if the things that God created were created as such, that when, when God created it and he looked it over and looked back and saw it, it in itself gave glory to God. Or, you know, so I believe... Insert the word worship. Amen. That the, the beauty of the things that God has created in the form and way in which he created them. And so certainly above all else, if we were created as such in the eyes of God, uh, amen, and, and given the intelligence that he gave us and made in the image and the likeness of himself, how much more? How much more than everything else, like the sun, the moon, the stars, 
How much more should we have a praise and a worship to God that we can speak to God, amen, in an intelligent way and, and, and give God praise and glory, lifting up uh, the God of creation, amen. And so uh, certainly worship, I think, has been a part of God's plan and creation since the day he created day one. You bet. So we, we certainly practice and we, uh, we carry out, we demonstrate uh, in our hearts and minds and certainly in the services. Uh, uh, of course, uh, it's something to shout about. You bet. That, that's the way we express uh, how God made us, how God created us, and, and the glory of God that we, God allows us to see and realize and experience a bit. So, yeah, why, why shouldn't we get happy? Amen. And get excited about, uh, our God. Amen. And the things that we are, that we receive, the thing, the knowledge we receive, the blessings we receive, uh, amen from God. That is something to shout about. We're not crazy. We're just excited and filled with joy. Amen. As I said, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. And so that, that is certainly something I believe God uh, created intentionally for us. And uh, this was the intention of God and by God that we, we would, would praise him and worship him. Amen. As such, this is the will of God. It is, this is all part of uh, why God created us. Amen. Well, in the lesson today, it's, it speaks about restoring worship. And, uh, and for that reason, then we have to uh, understand that apparently, uh, and, and as we know our, our history and, our, and the scriptures, uh, Israel uh, was uh, in a bad condition before God be, because God had brought judgment upon them. Uh, they were a people, uh, the people of God, that God had blessed mightily and greatly, uh, even to the extent during the reign of King Solomon, God had given them at this point in time um, uh, victory over all of their adversaries, had blessed them through the leadership of King Solomon that throughout all his days of reigning as king, they had peace from their enemies, peace. Uh, and, and they had the temple that was uh, uh, designed actually by God, uh, of course, built by Solomon, but it was in the mind and heart of King David. And he had conversation with God about building him in a house and and, and, and this was all done by that by the hand of God and and there was never before and not a prop, no doubt even since such a uh, con, uh, building constructed uh, unto God as uh, of course as what we call Solomon's temple a bed such beauty so uh, that stood out among all and everything else and it was all directed to God Amen. It, it was a reflection of the beauty of holiness, of the beauty of God. And, and, and God gave uh, instruction to uh, David and to Solomon and how all this was be put together and brought. And it was the, uh, a grand uh, sight to see when we read the scriptures. Where, of course, uh, um, uh, Israel, though, uh, and, and this is certainly forewarned. They, they were forewarned that with all of this, they need to maintain their relationship with God. They need to uh, carry on the things that they, God had given them. Certainly one of them, and the highlight of, of, of it, as a matter of fact, was uh, to worship God. Amen. Now you can worship God. Uh, certainly worshiping God is not just contained in a service like we have this morning to where 
we testify, we praise God. But worshiping God is, it goes beyond that. Worshiping God is even in the way that we live. Even in the way that we behave ourselves. Even in the way that we conduct ourselves. Even in the way that we walk uh, in this world and, and, and carry out life in this world. That the way we live, the way we talk, the things that we do are to bring back a reflection upon who we are and who we serve. God, our creator. Amen. And so... Uh, but something happened, as we know, in the history here of, the, of, of Israel. And in that, uh, they failed. They began to uh, fail in their walk with God, in the life that they lived. And even in the literal acts uh, of, of worship when they came to the temple, amen, they began to forsake the things of God, the ways of God, the commandments of God. And God gave them warning. God sent his prophets to them and warned, forewarned them uh, when they began to uh, backslide, if you will, and go back into a, a sinful state, a sinful nature. God forewarned them through the prophets. If you do this, then I'm going to have to judge you. I'll have to bring judgment upon you. And certainly judgment was eventually, of course, rendered. And God raised up um, a king, a power, the Babylonian Empire, we call it, uh, originally uh, uh, raised up by Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he was the king of this empire. And, and God stripped Israel, if you will, of their power, of their glory. Amen. They didn't even have a king that could no longer uh, serve. Amen. But they were, uh, of course, because of the judgment of God upon them, they lost everything. And uh, they were overcome uh, by uh, the Babylonian Empire. And they were taken in captivity uh, when, they, when, when they came against Jerusalem and seized Jerusalem and they took control of everything. Uh, they, uh, and having brought defeat upon, the, uh, 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 upon Israel, they took them into captivity. And all of those that had any kind of wealth, any kind of talent, uh, they, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar took back to Babylon. And they had to serve the Babylonian Empire with their uh, crafts and abilities and talents and, and all of that. And um, uh, so they were in bondage. But God spoke to them through the prophet. I think um, Jeremiah prophesied, Daniel prophesied. And we have in our lesson today uh, Ezra uh, being one of those that God uh, began to use. But in the previous days, with, uh, with the Babylonian Empire, they were completely overcome and overwhelmed. And they took back uh, the, uh, the, the greatest of, uh, of the empire of Israel. And uh, many of the prophets as well were taken in captivity. And, and so they lost it all. They lost it all. And uh, they couldn't even worship anymore like they were... I would like their fathers did in the glory days of, of King Solomon. They couldn't worship God. They couldn't uh, serve God. It's a, they were in a land of captivity. And they were stripped. They didn't, have, they, didn't even, they didn't have their temple. They didn't have their country. They lost it all. Amen. And you, you look and you see the history uh, of Israel uh, they, they, they lost it because they failed to continue to worship God. They failed and they then to serve God as God had instructed them. God promised them, if you do thus and thus and thus, I will do thus and thus and thus. You will be blessed. And they were. Amen. Because they, and they were, they, they had the freedom 
of serving God and worshiping God, amen, both in their, in their lifestyle as well as the times that they were able to, the privileges of that they were able to come and gather uh, uh, down at the temple. Oh, that was a, a beautiful, wonderful time. But they, uh, they lost it all. And not because, uh, not, not, not because that simply that uh, uh, the Babylonian people just up and decided to take him over. Uh, we see the hand of God in this. God used, matter of fact, God raised up the Babylonian Empire to be used as a rod of correction, if you will. This is the means of which God uh, used to correct them in the error of their ways. You say, that seems kind of harsh. But you have to understand the degree of the error of their ways. They deserve to, to be put to death. They deserve to be annihilated, to be taken completely because of their uh, disservice to God, because of their disrespect to God, because of their failure to honor and to bless God and to serve God, to walk with God, to keep his commandments and his statutes. Amen. They failed, not God. Amen. But God couldn't allow that to continue as such because God is a God of holiness. Amen. And so uh, when they fell in such like that, God used the Babylonian empire to bring judgment against them. And, and it was prophesied that they would be taken into captivity following uh, the defeat of the Israeli people and armies. I mean, they would go into a 70-year period of captivity. And this is what took place. This is what happened. And they, and being in captivity, they were no longer able to live as such. They were no longer able to worship. Oh, they may have had, they may have been some because the, they still had the prophets among them. There may have been some form of, uh, of some type of service, but uh, nothing like they had. They were not able to carry out their religious ceremonies because it was all stripped from them. They were no longer to, able to, to worship God in, 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 in any, uh, much of any way. Uh, they didn't have anything. But all they had was uh, perhaps they still had the psalms, if you will, the songs. That and but then even in that, uh, the Babylonian people would ridicule them and mock them and and shame them. Amen. And and this is the kind of life they had to live. This is what they've been living for seventy years upon the arrival here of. Uh, the intervention, I should say, of God. God began to restore them as he promised. As he promised. But it was not until and they began to hear the words of the prophets again. And God raised these prophets up with a number of prophets. Today we're dealing with Ezra, uh, who was uh, uh, a priest prophet, if you will, and uh, he was a, Ezra was a Jewish exile. He, in other words, he was one of those that when they took and raided Israel, Jerusalem, and took all these captives away, uh, Ezra was one of those. Amen. He was, he was uh, uh, exiled to the land of Babylon. And the Babylonian, uh, uh, the Babylonian Empire. Uh, Ezra, of course, as the history would show us, he was of the descent of the priesthood. Uh, and so God used this to, uh, to carry out his job. Uh, certainly Ezra wasn't the only one involved with the restoration of Israel, the restoration of Israel's worship, but he played a major role as he used his writings here today in the, uh, that be coming to pass. Uh, so after the 70 years of captivity, God moved upon a, a new power that God allowed to rise. And so this, this power was the, was the empire of the Persian uh, Empire. And 
they defeated uh, the Babylonian Empire. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar was long gone. Uh, it was either, I think, his grandson by this time. It had changed hands from Nebuchadnezzar to his son to his grandson. But uh, by this time, though, uh, the, the, the 70 years had come to pass. And God had then had moved upon a, another empire, allowed another empire to rise up uh, called the Persian Empire. And they came and they destroyed the Babylonian Empire. And as, and, and as such, because of the, uh, the hold that the Babylonian Empire had upon Israel, uh, the Persians, uh, they just took that over. But God, as we keep saying around here, but God, you know, you see, God had made promise and spoke to Israel through the prophets that at the end of 70 years, providing, of course, assuming, of course, that Israel would listen by now after 70 years of captivity, 70 years of losing the privileges and the, and the honor and the glory uh, of, of serving God and worshiping God and, and, and having the blessings of God upon them after that, uh, you can uh, see and understand why, you see, they would be uh, excited. Amen. Because God put it in the heart of Cyrus. God put it into the heart of Cyrus, who was the king of the Persian Empire. God put it in his heart. You see, God's always got control. Sometimes it doesn't look like it to us, but God is always in control. Amen. And he puts it in the heart of Cyrus in, in, in this way that uh, he was going to use Cyrus in, in the restoration process, amen, of his people, uh, Israel, if you will. And so he put it in the heart of Cyrus to, uh, to allow Israel the freedom to return back to homeland. Think about this now. They were in bondage. They were in prison. They were, and, and now... Uh, the king of Cyrus, he was, he had made a decree, he, made, he had made these decrees that we are now going to allow all of the Jewish people, amen, to return back to their homelands, amen. Now, everybody didn't return, but the majority or most of them, they began to, this didn't happen overnight, by the way, but uh, so they, they, the action was started and they began to go back to Jerusalem, and, amen. And in, in first order of business, they, they put into the hearts of those who, who were uh, blessed of God, the prophets and the priests and so forth. Uh, the first order of business was to uh, lay a foundation, amen. To lay a why, why? Well, everything was destroyed. Previously, everything was destroyed. And so now, in order to restore your worship, in order to restore your, uh, your uh, relationship with God, amen. Even, even before we begin to build any uh, buildings uh, outside of the temple, or any, the first order of business is, We've got to get ourselves right with God. Amen. We've got to get things right with God. We've got to renew. We've got to begin uh, uh, repairing uh, those things that have been destroyed. Even destroyed, no doubt, most of them were destroyed because of the enemy. But it was because of Israel's actions that the enemy was enabled to do that. Amen. Had Israel remained faithful in the beginning, it would have never come to this. It would have never come to this. So it's, it's not something that God did in the, in the sense that it was his fault. God has no fault. Amen. But it was by their actions. Amen. It was by their sinfulness 
their sinful ways that brought about the judgment of God. And this is just the way it, uh, uh, God has to do it. Amen. In, in order to get man to wake up and, and to realize his condition and bring him to a state and place of repentance. Amen. Because God has always required repentance. If you, if you can't repent, you can't get restored. And so this judgment, although seeming very harsh to some of us that God would allow such things to happen, you have to look at it from, the, from this, uh, that it took this because of the corruptness, evilness that was in the hearts of men now. It took an action such as this to cause them to come to themselves. Cause them to realize we have sinned. We have greatly sinned against our God and our creator. Amen. And we acknowledge. He brought them to an acknowledgement that yes, it is our fault. Not God's fault. It is our doings. Not God's doings. Amen. We are responsible for the condition of our land the condition of our people, amen. It's not God's fault, uh, but we're going to realize that God allows this judgment to take place to shake us up and to cause us to realize and recognize the error of our ways so that we could start action in the positive sense, amen, by the word of God to make restoration of our relationship with God. And in doing so, opened up uh, the avenue that would allow them to begin to once again have a relationship with our Creator, be able to praise Him, be able to worship Him, and and, and we this is a fulfillment of what God created us to do that we're able to worship our God, fellowship with Him. Amen. When we worship God, we are in fellowship with him. Amen. And, and, and so God has every right to expect us to worship him as we think. But it is a privilege to us. Amen. It's a privilege to worship God. It's an honor to worship God. Amen. But you have to do it in a way that's acceptable with God. Amen. It has to be an act of, of truthfulness. It has to be an act of uh, obedience. It has to be an act of, of love that we have towards our creator, towards our God. Amen. And that true worship, because there's, there's such a thing as false worship. God brought that out uh, many times. Amen. About their false worship. And saying, but this has got to be the real thing. If we want, if we want to be restored, amen, as God would have us to be, we have to be real. Have to be authentic, amen. Have to be in a spirit, in a state of, of uh, obedience to God. Because they were in a spirit of disobedience by the ways that they had uh, lived coming up to the time of the overthrowing of by uh, the Babylonian Empire, a amen. And the 70 years there of being uh, uh, whipped, if you will, being with a rod of correction. And it took this, uh, what we would think is a, a severe, severe uh, uh, form of, of uh, correction, but it just goes to show how, how bad it was in the hearts of Israel, that it would take this kind of action to get their hearts turned back to God. God only did what was necessary, amen, what was needful, and he did it in the spirit of, as a psalmist, we read about the psalm today, he did this all in the spirit of mercy, thank you Jesus. Now when you're getting corrected, you, you don't realize perhaps the spirit of mercy at that moment. But nevertheless, it's still there. Amen. It was by the mercy of God 
when we look at the state of Israel and the conditions they were in, and then look and see how they got to that place, how they got to that point, amen, then we can understand, we can, we, we, oh yes, I see, amen, I see the mercy of God, because you know what God could have done? He could have allowed the Babylonian empire to utterly wipe it, them off the face of the earth. That, that is reality, that could have happened, but God spared them. Amen. By his mercy. This would take an act of mercy. While the Babylonians had indeed had the power to do so, God wouldn't allow it. God wouldn't permit it. But had God just back, backed off altogether, Israel could have been completely annihilated. Amen. But because of his mercy, he said, I'm going to give you another opportunity. You know, in the beginning, they wasn't in a position. They, they would have laughed at God. They would have, figuratively speaking, they would have spit in God's face and, and then probably did, and indeed did so. Amen. Because of their rebellious spirit and their evil ways. Amen. Something had to break that. Something had to stop that. And it's called the judgment of God. Amen. Now, of course... Everybody didn't uh, uh, follow along with it. Everybody didn't agree to it. And many of uh, the people of Israel died and were destroyed by their own doings. Again, not God's fault, but by their own doings. But then there were some that maintained their faith in God, even though many of their privileges were taken from them. They still held on to their faith in God. And we have a number of those in our Bibles. Uh, Ezra uh, just being one of those. We have Daniel. We have uh, all the prophets. Amen. Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of the prophets of God. And we have those that are mentioned in the scriptures. Uh, even in the hardest of times. You see, God, the scripture says God has never been without witness. And so... Regardless of how bad it got and whatever dispensation it was, time it was, there's always been somebody who loved the Lord. Somebody who walked, wanted to try to do the best they could to walk with God. Amen. So God has always had a witness. Amen. And so even in the toughest of times. And, and so um, but God can use whomsoever and whatsoever. In the state, in the, in the, in the, when we're looking at it today in, the, in this uh, uh, form of uh, punishment, God used the Babylonian Empire to start with. And then he, uh, of course, uses uh, Cyrus uh, to, uh, again, allow them to return back to their homeland, back to a place to where they can begin anew. Now, as we know, we, this didn't happen all at once or overnight, but it was the beginning. You had to start somewhere. You had to start, amen, and finding out what, Lord, must I do in order to be restored to the place I need to be, amen. What must I do? And, of course, we carry out the history, we search out the history of Israel, and we see the things that God uh, moved upon the prophets and caused them to do. Because up until now, there were a good many of them that the Bible identifies as false prophets. Amen. They, there was many of those that rose up in the land and they began to prophesy not the things that God said, but the things that were on their heart to do. They began to prophesy according to their ways, their desires. Amen. This was one of the problems that arose in the condition of Israel. But God had those who were right with him. And they began to, they prophesied. Now they wasn't received very well. Remember, of course, Jeremiah had, had a tough time uh, with his prophecy because his prophecies 
contradicted the false prophets. His prophecies went against the, the false prophets. And so uh, this certainly was part of the problems there. And when they, begin, when they got back to Jerusalem, God used various ones to get the things going, to get the, uh, the foundation, to get the walls, to get uh, the altar. These are things that are first and foremost. First thing they had to do is acknowledge God. And they had to uh, repent, amen, of the, of the sinful ways that had gotten them to this point. But then in the restoration here, they had to go back to what God had instructed them in the beginning, that he would accept uh, from his people as true worship, as true uh, obedience, as true love towards God. This all had to come to, to fruition to that, that God would again continue to bless them and open up the doors of opportunity so that they could restore their uh, place with God. Amen. I'd like to uh, use a couple of New Testament uh, references here this morning in the closing of our lesson that we realize that we need to have a good relationship with God. And when we, when we use the uh, examples that we had back here uh, concerning how they got in that mess. Amen. We also see how God directed their paths so that they could get out of that condition and back in favor with God. And so they, uh, they did. They began to do things and make moves that began to put Israel back in a, the right uh, direction. But it didn't come easy, and it didn't come without opposition. And it took many, many, many years to actually get to what we would say was the dedication of the temple uh, that replaced Solomon's temple. And, and so uh, it, it was a difficult time, but God blessed them and brought them and delivered them, did things that would, uh, as he promised, we have a God that keeps his promises. But I'd like to read uh, some scripture here concerning uh, what this all means to us. Because we may not be Jewish, but we have been grafted in. Amen. We have been grafted in. And we are the children of God. We are the children of God. Amen. By the mercy of God. And by, amen, obeying and keeping God's commandments that he given to us, amen, because God has grafted us, the Gentiles, if you will, into his grace and mercy. And we too can have a place with God that we can worship him, that we can return back to uh, the original uh, form which God created us. And that is that we would be able to worship our creator, to praise our creator. Amen. And so, uh, first of all, I want to uh, take you to the sixth chapter of Luke. And Jesus speaking here says, uh, I'll just take verse 47 and 48. He says here in verse 47, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings. Amen. You see, it's all, it all has to come from God. If we're going to get to the place we need to be, that we must be, to be able to serve God as a creation of God and, 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 and holiness and beauty and holiness, amen, it all comes back to, to the word of God. He said, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Now, this, of course, we didn't take the time this morning to go into the details of the process of Israel back there with the Babylonians and with the Persian, uh, amen, but they had to go through the, the, this process of, 
of getting back in favor with God and back in the proper relationship with God. And Jesus is speaking now to the New Testament era, amen, which includes not only just the Jews, but the Samaritans, the Gentiles alike, whomsoever will. He said, whomsoever cometh to me. Amen. We got to come to Jesus. If we want to have our uh, worship restored and, and, and a place that is acceptable with God, amen, we've got to come to Jesus. And he, and do with them, he said, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man that built a house. So here we are dealing with the, the temple or the building of God. He is like a man who built a house and they dig deep. Amen. And laid the found, and laid the foundation on a rock. Amen. Well, you know what? Jesus is our foundation, but Jesus is also our rock. Amen. He's the rock of our salvation. Amen. And so uh, we have to put our trust in him. And we have to follow his word, his commandments. All right. And, and Jesus said uh, that he's like a man that put his house upon a found of uh, the rock. The foundation upon a rock. When, and, and, and then doing so, when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. See, the first thing that they had to do back there in the days of Ezra and the other prophets there at that time, they had to get their foundation laid. Before they could begin on any other part of the building and get the temple uh, restored and completed, you have to start with foundation. We all know that. I'm not a builder, uh, you know, or anything like that, but I do know that. You have to have, if you want a building, you want it to last, you want it to be in good shape, you've got to start with a good foundation. If you start a house, on a bad foundation, you're going to have a bad house. If you have a, if you built a house on a good foundation, you're going to have a good house. And this is what Jesus is uh, uh, letting us know about here. That a wise man, smart guy, amen, if he wants to do the job right, amen, he has to lay his down his foundation upon a solid rock. Amen. So when the winds come and the storms blow and the rains fall, because you're founded upon a solid foundation, you will stand. Amen. So we want to get back to glory and worship and praise with God. Well, and in doing so, we have to get started right. We have to get started right. We have to lay our faith, our foundation of our faith upon a solid rock. And that rock is Jesus. Amen. One more place, and then I'll, I'll uh, close up here. In the book of Corinthians, Paul writes here in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, beginning at verse 9, where he says, We are laborers together. We is talking about the leadership of the church, uh, the fellowship among the saints of God. Amen. And of course, we know he's talking about the New Testament church here. We're not talking about Solomon's temple, we're not talking about uh, the temple of Herod, we're talking about uh, the New Testament church. Amen. Not made with hands, not made with mortar or brick or, or anything like that, but it was, he said, we are laborers together with God, you are God's husbandry, you are God's building. We are God's building, amen. And we, as a building, we are built upon this foundation. He said, according to the grace of God, by the grace of God, by the mercy, the psalmist said, by the mercy of God, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. This is Paul referring to himself here. He says, a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. Back to that original place we got to start. Amen. As they did back there in the days of Ezra. They had to get first things first. Amen. Paul said, I have laid the foundation. He's talking about the church now, the New Testament church. And the foundation that he laid, of course, 
And he said, another man buildeth thereabout, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereabout. For other foundation can no man lay. Folks, there isn't any other foundation. You've got to have a foundation. It's got to be a good foundation. But there is only but one so, uh, foundation that you can build upon, that you can lay, uh, the, start the house upon. And that is, he said, no man can be laid, which is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. So uh, the lesson is about restoring our worship and our position with God. Well, the Bible has it all diagrammed out. We, we use our scriptures as uh, they had to even back there. We use our scriptures to direct uh, our, our paths, direct our ways, amen, that will line up. Amen. With the foundation of God. Amen. We have to build upon the foundation that was laid by God. Paul said, and I'm a master builder of it. And he said, I have laid this foundation. This is the foundation I put. My preaching, my teaching in Jesus, Paul is, is letting us know. Building upon the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what we got to do. Then we can worship. Then we can praise. Then we can serve God as we ought. Amen. Then we'll have the victory that's in Jesus. Amen.